this morning as we uh, further into the hot seat series, we've been putting different topics into the hot seat. And you may be wondering, why are we doing that as a church? Well, the reality is, is that the church needs to be speaking into the different topics that we engage with each and every day. And they might be a little controversial to talk about, but that's okay. We're a brave church because we're brave disciples. Amen. We want to live a life of faith. We want to be uh, in the Word and of the Word. We want to be uh, able to overcome anything in life that may derail us or, did, or not have us be in, in sync with God's truth in our life. And so these are topics that stem from how God created us and, and what really what evil has done in the world. And at times we see our the fickleness of our own human heart and what it's done with the relationship with God, what it's done to the relationship with each other, and what it's done to our relationship with creation. Because those were the three things that fell when Eden was lost. And so this morning we're going to be putting sexuality into the hot seat this morning. We're going to get real church. And so I want to be able right from the get-go to ask that together that we allow this environment to be safe and we allow this environment to be loving. Amen? And when the church gathers on Sunday, rather I said you didn't gather to church because you are the church and wherever you are is where the church is. And when the church gathers on Sunday, it needs to be willing to take a considerate look into the heart of God and to be informed on how we are to grow, how we are to live, and how we are to demonstrate the love of God to Him, to each other, and to the fallen world. And it's been my hope that this sermon will benefit us and others when we engage in the world we live in. This world that we live in is full of cheap and exploited messages about the worth and value of the human body. And I want you, the church, to be versed and prepared to speak a better story than the culture is speaking right now. And the story that God created our bodies with a high regard for a purpose that pleases Him in the relationship we are to have with Him, not only with Him, but with each other. And if we've adopted the belief that, well, any kind of expression between two consenting adults is fine, then it suggests that God is not interested in the bodies He gave us and what we do with them. Even though God Himself came as a body and dwelt amongst us in order to redeem us through what he experienced in his flesh. And this speaks to a deeper truth that God is greatly concerned with the vessels of our souls that we inhabit and what is done with them while we live on this earth. He is greatly concerned. And to this, we're going to look at what Paul, the Apostle Paul spoke about to the church in Corinth. And we're going to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. If you can turn with me now, you can look on your new version app, or you can look in your own paperback Bible. This is what Paul says. I have the right to do anything, you say. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything, you say. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By His power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and He will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ Himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Amen. It's pretty piercing words from Paul. Hallelujah. Be straightforward. 
And we need to read first at the beginning of that, that stanza there, that paragraph. What Paul is saying, he's actually repeating back what is common in, in Corinth at the time, which I believe is really common today. It's a mantra. It's a maxim. It's really re relevant. It says, I have the right to do anything. That's a pretty common statement today as it was then. And really what this is, this is the rally cry. This is the mission statement. This is the motto of anyone who has a kingdom of self intact. Your kingdom of self will say, I have the right to do anything. And it's a stance that is blind to the overwhelming dependence that we are to have on God's love, on his care, and on his mercy. And Paul quoted this as well, food for the stomach and stomach for the food. And he says this as also as a stance that the mantra or the idea of the kingdom of self is that the body is separate from anything that has to do with God. That they don't interact. God should not be involved in or that it should not be part of the public concern of the church is what Paul is kind of saying. You say this, but the word the Lord says this. And so we need to answer right from the get-go, <laughs> why is there a public concern for such a private talk? topic. Why are we talking about this? Public versus private. Why does this need to come up in the church? Well, the nature of sin or belief, action, or thought process apart from God, separate from God, not obedient to God, not interested in God, is very hyper-vigilant and lacks restraint when it says, my life is mine. My life is mine. It's very much just the nature of of anything, of anyone, any thought, any craving apart from God. And so sin rises up for, to protect and to reinforce the sovereignty of self. The self is reigning over God when we have the kingdom of self and we save that. And we have placed ourselves on the throne of our hearts instead of Jesus. However, the kingdom of God requires death to self. That's why we talk about it. See, when we look... In John 12, 25 through 26, Jesus says, Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. I don't know about you, but I, I want the Father to bless my life. I want to live a prosperous life. And sometimes there are moments when I do say, my life is mine. And I suddenly choke out what the Spirit can do. Far better than any best tip that I have. I don't know if you've been there, if you are. There. And here's the thing. Until we bring our bodies with all its wants, with all its desires, with all its inclinations into a place of self-sacrifice, then we receive these words of Jesus as more of an imposition than an invitation. We see Jesus imposing upon our kingdom of self. I want that to marinate a little bit. <laughs> and if we, if we don't see this as an invitation, then, then any morality of sexuality will just not make sense to you. Why? Why would I give that up? Or why would I bring that a limit to that? Or why, why would I put that in a direction that pleases God? Why abstain? Why remain pure? Why remain faithful in action, in heart, in mind, in eyes? Why? Because we would see Jesus as an imposition of trying to ruin our parade, trying to ruin our fun. Because we say, it's my life, it's mine. The kingdom of self says, it's my God, get away. It's my community of faith. It doesn't affect you, so I'm going to put up a Sunday front. You're not going to know what's going on in that part of my life. Because I don't want you to talk about it, touch it, or even know about it. But that's the thing that we see is so eroding to the kingdom. Is when we start to say, it's mine. It's my life. Instead of, here God, it's yours. Here God, take it. Here God, I surrender. And so church, first we need to come to a place to realize that these bodies that we got... They're not made for us. They're made for the Lord. They're made for God. And through the belief in the heart and the confession of faith of the tongue, these bodies are actually 
transformed and are actually now part of Jesus' body. Can you, can you even kind of start to wrap your head around that? The moment you believe in your heart and you confess it with your mouth, like Paul says in Romans 9, this body is now Jesus'. Yeah. Consider that. It's not you anymore. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. So if that's the case, how should the body of Christ be conducting itself, manifesting in you? Kind of changes our lens a little bit. And it's good to be challenged that way. And that is why we need to talk about this. But before we go any further, we need to kind of approach some of the surrounding topics, issues around this topic of sexuality that is a part of our everyday lives. We need to kind of dismantle, look at it, go, hmm, okay, I understand a little bit differently now, I hope. Sin nature, or what I like to say, kind of this malformed, twisted heart that we've been given the moment we exhale the first time in this world, has had you believe that sex is a need. It's a need. And if that were true, then we would say that Christ himself, when he lived on this earth, did not experience the full experience of humanity, if that was the truth. So the first thing we need to do is we need to differentiate some things here. We need to differentiate. Sex is not a need. Sex is a want. Intimacy is a need. To be known is a need. To be understood, to be in that safe place is a need. So the world wants to switch it up and have you focus in on a different way to get it. And there is such a loss in our meaning when we have reduced the connection between each other, when we think we should focus in and what we should focus in on has more to do with our parts than our personhood. We need to focus in on what God has really called valuable, not what the world has called valuable. And so many messages have been adopted by the world that we live in who have blurred the lines between intercourse and intimacy. It's sad to say, but it's the truth. We blurred that. And we settle for function as to be the, the be all to fulfill this deep longing to be known. That deep longing you have to be known, that's intimacy. It was put in you by God. He wants you to have that connection with Him. That's why it's there. And all these other cheapened cheap, cheap ways and exploited ways are trying to make revenue off of that, I guess. Well, you may say, well, it just is what it is. It's separate. It's, it's not anything more than just a function. And culture wants to reduce sexuality to just kind of just this biology. We live in this culture of hookup. And in the hookup culture, it doesn't require a commitment, doesn't require a relationship, doesn't even require a friendship. And it's really wanting, the culture wants us to, to see it as just being toted around as just a choice of the self that is as casual as a conversation. And the biological exchange is no one's responsibility except the person involved. But what if it's actually meant for more? What if it actually means more? Matthew 19.5 says this, For this reason a man will leave his mother and father and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Amen. Scripture shares with us that when a man leaves his mother and father and joins with his wife, that they become one. Amen. This is not casual. There is such intimacy that there is almost like a new person. This gives us grounds to see that this just isn't an act. It's so much more valuable. Not only valuable, it's, it's really important potent to the human spirit that any in every exchange there is a bond made and when there's not a commitment and it's outside the confines of a covenant that bond is broken and if it's not invested how God has called us to invest it that bond is, that broken bond is going to hurt Amen. as a youth pastor I used to do this talk a lot where I would glue a, a, a pink piece of paper to a blue piece of paper, right? And I'd glue them together, and then I'd have this that sexual purity talk. And what I would do, I'd say, when you have sex outside of marriage, and then that bond is made and broken, it's like these two pieces of paper, and I would tear them apart, 
And what would happen? Pieces of the blue would stick with the pink, and the pink would stick with the, stick with the blue. Because that's what happens to our heart. We can't get away with that. Amen. And as I did more and more, I got more dramatic and you know, pulled different pieces, bigger pieces of paper together. Do you get it? You know? Because I wanted them to know how important this is, how much it hurts. Because it was made to be a very valuable, intimate thing. Amen. And this is what we, and many who find themselves at the tail end, I think of very many several encounters and conquests, they find themselves to feel torn up, ripped apart, incomplete, Hallelujah. hardened and bitter, not fulfilled, and not without corrosion to the pathways of intimacy and fulfillment. What does it take for the human heart to realize that it's actually damaging our capacity to love and to receive love when we do this? That we're exchanging something so deep for moments of escape and pleasure that don't sustain. But when we get it. Well, you might say, well, it's not hurting anyone. What do you care? It's not hurting anyone. Ouch. I think that's another common way to say my life is mine, not yours, God. Now, I consider the moments as a pastor, I got about 15 years behind me of being able to be involved in people's lives. They've invited, invited me in, first with students, college, young adults, of all ages, I've been able to counsel in this area. And I've just seen people over the last 15 years that they've left a watermark of their tears and pain in the memory of my mind and my experiences of how decisions to not connect this part of their body with their spirituality, how, how it their inability to regard this or, or bought the lie of sexuality that the culture wants, how just the aftermath that they have are left with and the outcome that it involves with other people, the unplanned pregnancies, the disease, the abortion, the molestation, the rape, the confessions and the use of pornography, the addiction to it, the damage of people's reputations, the people who have to leave jobs, who have to leave communities, who have to leave churches, the loss of marriages, the tears of, of kids who are broken apart by divorce. Amen. It's so real and it's so painful. Amen. Oh, Amen. The strain on relationships, the embarrassment of not being able to invite that person to an event or wedding because of previous relationships. Hallelujah. This mispractice of sex in our world has created more pain than I think in almost any other evil. But it's not hurting anybody, right? <laughs> We're destroying each other out there. Amen. For what? The story of the world's sexual ethic is really just a selfish quest. What am I going to get? How am I going to meet the needs? And who is that going to be? It's use and abuse. It's cheap pleasure without the cost of covenant. But this is not the story of the people of God. Amen. Ours is a narrative of intimacy, of lifelong covenant, of being bonded and remaining bonded in selfless love. Hallelujah. So I ask, which narrative today, single or married, writes the narrative of your life today? And in my reading, I discovered a new way to talk about evangelism. I really like it. It's this. It's telling someone into a better story. I like that because it gives me the opportunity for us to proclaim a new story in your life. God has a better story for you. God, Jesus has a better outcome for you. Hallelujah. And we are to understand the way we are to regard our lives, both in the spirit and in the flesh. We get to benefit a deep lasting love that seeks to put this area of our lives into a narrative that overcomes all previous participation in a lesser and more damaging story. God's story trumps them all. Thank God who does that. And in these verses to the Corinthians, Paul wants to draw out some key points and I want us to see them very clearly this morning. He wants the church to bear in mind and to keep removing themselves off the throne of their hearts and putting Jesus in the middle of their, of their throne of their life. And the first one is this. 
bodies are made for the Lord. Our bodies are marvelous creations. They are so complex. I don't. I haven't figured out mine yet. It's really come on, get it together, right? <laughs> and they are good. I want you to know that your body is good under the creation of God. God made all things good. Yes. Right. Yeah. And their purpose and function by God's hand by God's hand was for Him to take the light from them, like the rest of creation. To say they are for the Lord is to direct their purpose in all manners of how they are to bring God glory by them. So what do we do with our bodies? Can either be led to fulfill the needs of its function, like eating and sleeping and protection and shelter, or they can be directed to fill the needs of the heart, intimacy, purpose, vocation, pleasure. It just comes down to if they're going to be devoted to the erosion of self-corruption, because that's what happens when the the kingdom of self reigns. It just erodes who you were created to be. As you continually to say, no, it's my life, it's mine, God. And he's like, I got a better story for you. You open to that yet? Jesus goes behind, he goes deep. He goes behind every part of our sexuality, even down to the act of a look. That is why our minds are in such, I would say, a battle when it comes to this area of our life. When we in our minds can manipulate another person in our mind without their consent, without their permission, without, or, or we become very proficient of objectifying people. They're no longer persons, they're objects. That's dehumanizing. And when we do that to others, that's a sin. We said that person's no longer a person. They're an object for me. That's not our call. But we have an industry and a world that makes a lot of money off of that. The body was not made for you, it was made for the Lord. And not only that, bodies are part of Christ's body. Your body is part of the body of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. You are a new creation. Don't let anyone tell you that, especially the past. You are a new creation in Christ. The old is where? Ah. And the new is where? Here. That's right. Hallelujah. Sometimes we forget. Wow. Bodies are part of Christ. Our bodies are part of Christ. And this asks us to seriously consider losing our right to our own body. That's a, that's a big sacrifice. To surrender, so give it to Jesus, to repeatedly bring yourself out of the ownership and entitlement and into the servanthood and obedience of how God would operate and what we have claimed to be His. God, take my life, take my heart, take everything. And then we try to take it back, right? <laughs> and if this is you, and you're in that tension of trying to yield everything to God, especially what happens and what you do with your body, then I, I have a lot of respect for you because I feel like you're in those phases, you're in that battlegrounds of really trying to find a deepening faith. Faith that's authentic, that's real, that's tangible, that's sustainable. You want to be in a relationship with God in spirit. And you find that God in spirit is more worthwhile than any tangible entanglements on here on earth. That's a big act of faith right there. Yeah. Trust God who is in spirit more is worth more of a sacrifice of surrendering yourself than anything that you can tangibly hold and control. It's a big act of faith. So keep taking those bold steps. Keep realizing that God's delight and joy is how you identify your body as part of the literal manifestation of Jesus on this globe. It's our bodies. And we have to realize that we are joined with the Lord one in spirit. There's communion with God. I'm sorry. We're not separate. The church today, I would say, is very deficient in disciples who have integrated their faith into all areas of their lives. Author Stephen Farrar, he writes a book called Point Man. It's, it's a little bit older now, but uh, he makes a word, he makes a point that disciples in the church today when it comes to the Word of God, when it comes to Scripture, they are either anorexic, not having enough, or they're believing, meaning they take it in, but they can't adjust it, and then they, they take it out again. 
So we see a lot in the world, we are either malnourished in the truth, that we don't have the strength when we try to test it into the, the realities and the pressures of the world to put into practice what it says we should be doing with our bodies. Or we live a life where we are seen to ingest the truth. When we read Corinthians, we go, yeah, that's how I'm going to treat my body. And then we act that way in maybe in a certain dimension of our life, but maybe in some places we take it all up and we don't participate in it anymore. The life of faith that is walking in the light of God's truth is not compartmentalizing it. It's not putting it on and taking it off like a sweater. It's not what we do with faith. Because when God has sealed your life with your faith, it's done. It's finished. What if God took his love for us, redemption for us, off, off and on like a sweater? That'd be kind of scary, right? Mm -hmm. We'd be a little worried, right? Is that today or was that yesterday, God? So we got to remember that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul says in verse 19. And it's really easy for us to consider that there's a disconnect if God dwelt in a tabernacle in the middle of the room. If this was the temple, if we were part of temple worship, as is laid out in Leviticus. We could depart from God's spirit if it just dwelt here. We could go to our homes and be like, yeah, God, he's over there. He's, he's in that building. There's priests and all their vestibules and everything that's laid out for proper worship. Then I, I figure out a way to approach that, right? But that's the thing. It's, it's a big responsibility when we realize that the, the spirit of heaven actually dwells within our hearts. We're the temple. That's a big responsibility. That's a big shift. The temple, this body is a temple of God. I mean, can we take that in for a moment? The, the Holy Spirit, holy, right? That's the beginning of the name. Holy, right? Has found its home in you, in me. It's a lot of grace. It's a lot of love. That's a lot of opportunity. It's a big responsibility. That's why Paul elevates sexual sin in many ways here, because it's a violation of the temple of God when we don't treat it how it should be treated. And these acts are against his own body, God's own body, and we, when we bring impurities and when we bring forms of a superficial connection or lust and, and selfish purposes, if we practice these acts that exploit and counterfeit what we are to be enjoying and produce in our lives, if our bodies are devoted and given to God in our in, in our spouse, in our marriage, in our covenant relationship, that's that's the goal, is to find that that's where God's called us to, to be. And we understand that the binding of our bodies is meant to be sacred, honorable, and the value we have in heaven and towards our spouses are to complement the precious gifts of our bodies that they are. Not only this, we should dare not to compromise each other if we regard one another as another dwelling place of God's Spirit. We should show love, regard, goodness. We shouldn't objectify another human soul because that is a potential or is a place where the Holy Spirit dwells. That's how we should regard one another when it comes to our bodies. And finally, we see that Paul has said, we have been bought at a price, verse 20. We should be seeing our lives being infiltrated by the story of the gospel all over the place. Part of it takes place when we realize that our redeemed relationship with the Father, when we see that it was very costly to him. It costs a lot to be in relationship with us, for God. It costs His own Son. Through the breaking of God's body, ours are to be redeemed as worthy vessels to inhabit the Holy Spirit. That's, a, that's, that's astounding to think about what God went through to redeem us so that we live a life empowered and free from sin. And to understand ourselves as redeemed means that we understand the cost of what was accomplished through the death and the crucifixion of Jesus. All the brokenness, all the treason of self, or violence that we've experienced, or the victimization we've experienced that occurs against us has been atoned for, has been wiped away. 
because we have decided. God gives us the choice. We have decided to commit to the ways of God, the ways that honor God, the ways that we honor Him with our bodies. And we are only able to make such this such a bold decision of commitment because we have a sense of God's love for us and that He has lavish worth unto us. I don't know if you struggle with self-worth. I don't know if you struggle with body shaming. But we have to realize that God loves you every which way. Amen. He loves all of you. Yes. And we see that by what He's done to the body of Christ. He broke it for us. He spilled His blood for us. So that our spirit and our heart and our minds and our bodies can be redeemed. And these bodies are precious. They were made to feel every kind of emotion. But not at the cost of dumping their worth for the use and abuse of cheap gratification and a momentary escape. And the manner in which we encounter each other should complement how we have encountered God. That's how we should encounter one another. We see that we have such regard and value for God that He saved us. He saved you. And we should regard each other as the redeemed, not as objects. And this goes in the realm of singleness and those who are in the covenant of marriage because every sexual expression outside of marriage is still saying to the Father, my life, mine. And yet we're saturated in our society with ambiguous steps between singlehood and marriage that involve sexuality. Also, there's this, this deep regard, or dis, disregard, excuse me, for this covenant. And therefore, whatever pinnacle of expression that exists apart from God in this area of our lives is really the center of a lot of people's worth. When people try to find, obtain the most, the largest, the greatest sexual reality apart from God, that's the meaning of their worth, instead of what God says they're worth. That's empty. And no wonder sexuality is all over the place. It has turned sacredness of our personhood and has exploited them to meet for any means of attention or income or entertainment. And all the while, we, each and every one of us, have this deep desire to have an attachment and security that God has made in us. And we were made to want a secure attachment to God and with one another. And I don't know if in your attachments with God and your attachments with another person, if you are full of anxiety or security. But God wants you to have security that's unshakable. God wants you to have peace in your relationships with the Father and with one another. And that happens by how we conduct ourselves, how we honor each other, how we honor ourselves. That's Paul's point here. And in the area of singleness, it seems that we have a culture today that is more of slide instead of the side. We slide into relationships these days. We're too ambiguous. It's too risky to make a commitment or ask someone out on a date. So you say, you want to hang out? Because hanging out, there's no commitment there. Oh, if you say no, well, okay, I didn't mean anything other than hanging out, right? <laughs> Instead of asking, do you want to go on a date? No, get away from me. Or, yes, I'd like to go on a date, right? So we slide into relationships. Want to hang out again? Let's hang out again. And so what happens when we don't have this commitment, what we're actually doing is we're not regarding our own self-worth. We're not regarding their worth. We're not deciding to have a commitment. We're deciding just to slide in. Is this okay? Is this okay? Is this okay? Right? So we slide into deeper and deeper access. At some point, we run into complications because there hasn't been a decision made. And when we finally want to make a decision, because one party finally can't take it any longer, or they're at the point of commitment, because there's emotional bonding, right? And then there's an abrupt discovery when one's like, no way, we're just hanging out, right? And the other one's like, I'm ready to get married, right? So now all the time that was invested and wasted in, in income and connection was not communicated and now it's broken and it hurts. And we see all these broken, all these false starts of relationships today because everyone is sliding in instead of deciding, 
and say, no, I have worth, and you have worth. I want to honor God, so I'm going to be clear. I'm going to communicate. i got some character. I want to have a connection. I don't want this, this endless sin cycle of sliding in and sliding out. No, I want to make a decision because I see that this area of my life has value. And sexuality is complex. It has multiple factors and influence to it as we see our children develop in these expressions into hopeful, healthy achievement as adults. And we as adults struggle to have a deep connection with God by either releasing control in many areas of our life at the price of deeper devotion, or we are tempted to compartmentalize faith and we say to God, God, you could have my soul, take care of that, but um, maybe, maybe my heart, but okay, maybe my mind, but the last thing we seem to give him is our body. Because we want control still at some level. The disciple needs to say, Lord, you can have my heart, you can have my soul, you can have my mind, you can have my body. It's yours. I give it to you. I surrender it. I no longer say it's mine, it's my life. No, it's yours. I give it to you. And if we aren't willing to surrender the right to self for the freedom of being rooted in Christ completely, then we're missing out on deeper works that God wants to do in us and greater testimonies that we can live out a better story if we're still holding on to some area of control because we're not willing to risk a greater love that God has called us to. And this dimension of sexuality has become, I think, for many, the chief source of identity. For those who don't root it in God, those who are not being given a better story in God for their sexuality and how it fits into their devotion and their practice and how God has become the Lord of all parts of their life <clears throat> can become confused and can compensate their identity by having sexuality more elevated in their identity. Their identity and everything else is defined by how their, their sexuality is understood, how it's displayed, and how it interacts with all other ways that it either complements God's word or it departs from it. And, and for some, that has been a reason to reject God. For others, the complexities in their lives have unfortunately been a reason why the church has rejected them. And through many expressions, challenges and experiences that people bring in the door surrounding their lives in this area, we are to be a community of love and healing, not of aqua stairs. We are to commit to being the better story of the gospel and to present it without hindrance, for God is the one who saves and breaks into the mind, who breaks into the heart, who breaks into the body, who breaks every chain like we sang this morning. That's what we want Jesus to do. We give him the reign of that, not us. So how is the church, how are we, church, refusing to put ourselves in the seat of judgment in order to punish or alienate others that we just don't understand? But God does. God understands them completely. Our call is to love them. And how are we willing to be present in the need to demonstrate that God can redeem, God can restore, God can heal, and others to define that there is a biblical ethic of sexuality. How are we willing to show up and be there? And if you want to witness and bear witness to God in your generation, if you want to demonstrate the essence of this biblical holiness, this covenant love, not contractual love, what well, messed up amount? No, the covenantal love, I'm with you, I forgive you, I'm with you, I know it hurts, let's keep going. Let's keep following this life of faith, it's a better story. If you want to define Christian in your life, then we need to debunk the trends that are saturating God, God's people and live a distinctively different life. And we do this by rooting everything in ourselves in a biblical understanding of our humanity, especially our sexuality. I'm so glad that the Bible talks about this, right? It gives us a little bit, oh, whoops, or oh, thank goodness, I'm on the right track. And as a single or married adult who finds their core identity in Christ, we must form our relationships that are marked by communication, by commitment, and character. You know 
that sex means something sacred. It cannot be disconnected from the rest of you. It cannot be disconnected from your devotion to God. It's part of it. And it may be awkward to talk about this, but I'm being really brave because I love you. And I want you to have some biblical input in this area of your life. That's what the church is supposed to be about. Building you up, teaching you, informing you, encouraging, enlightening some truth through these areas. Yeah. You don't think I'm a little nervous up here? I've been nervous, but here I am, talking to you because I love you. <laughs> Go ahead. And it's not for the casual hookup, this whole thing about sexuality. It's, it's not to objectify one another. It's not to find it on your screen time. It's not that person that is out and about that fulfills a fantasy. No, no. It's the God-given bonding of a man and woman in a covenantal relationship of marriage that God is calling us to live into. To seek to find. And the opportunity is to witness how the power of God redeems this area of our lives. No matter how much we as a culture want to complicate. The culture wants to complicate. But Christ wants to simplify it and make it make it appropriate for us to live into. Nothing is too complicated for God to work the truth into. Amen? We want to complicate it a lot, but God wants to say, hey, let go. I'll handle this. Be obedient. Trust me. Pray to me. Bring accountability in. And let's see what work we can do in you and through you. That's the whole thing of discipleship. This is the narrative that is our identity. In all areas of our lives, what it means to be human, rooted in Jesus. And we are to stand and experience Christ. Fill every need and every desire and to bring intimacy where we are meant to receive it and give it. And all the while we are to communicate to the world who has nothing to give us but really a malformed expression of this part of us wants to sell it to you, wants to give it to you, that there's actually something that lasts beyond when our body has returned to dust. This is all going through the dust, right? That we are devoted, that we are defined, and we are dedicated to the abundant life found in Christ. And that's what we want to see take place, especially in this area of our lives.